Hello, and thank you for watching this presentation by the American Iron Society. Please support the organization by becoming a member. Go to irises.org and click on join. Thank you. So welcome everyone. And uh, tonight we are uh, happy to have um, the 34th webinar in our series um, in the past uh, almost three years. And uh, tonight, uh, the topic is Knowing and Growing Siberian Irises. And uh, our speaker is uh, Bob Hollingworth. And uh, Bob has been growing and hybridizing and knowing Siberian Irises for more than 40 years, with nearly 90 introductions to his name. Of those, 11 um, of his introductions have won the Morgan Wood Medal which is the highest award for a Siberian iris uh, besides the dikes. And one, Swans in Flight, went on to win the American Dykes Medal. Bob also won the Randolph Perry Medal with Who's On First for species uh, hybrids. Uh, Bob has been awarded the American Iris Society's Hybridizers Medal, the AIS Distinguished Service Medal, and the Sir Michael Foster Memorial Plaque from uh, the British Iris Society. Uh, Bob is a past president of the Society for Siberian Irises and of the AIS Foundation. He is an emeritus uh, Iris judge and chairman of the AIS Scientific Advisory Committee and currently is also editor of the Siberian Iris, the publication of the Society for Siberian Irises. And he's a professor emeritus at Michigan State University. Bob, welcome. So uh, yeah, good, appreciate it. And um, it's a topic that has interested me for a long time. And sometimes when you get talking about topics that interest you, you go off at some length. So I've tried to limit myself here, but I'm not sure whether I'll succeed or not. So be patient if you will, please. Uh, before I get started on the, uh, the talk itself, I wanted to mention a couple of the previous uh, webinars that are in this series because they do underlie a bunch of what I was going to say, and I don't need to repeat it. Uh, one is on Iris pest management that we did, uh, oh, I don't know, a couple of years back, a year or so. So there's really no point in me talking at any kind of length about managing pests on Siberians. You can find that out if you go to the pest management talk. Uh, and then um, just recently, Patrick Spence gave a nice basic judges training on Siberians. And uh, I'll repeat a little bit of that, but it's not my intention to give a basic talk on, on uh, judging Siberians more. I want to talk about growing them, what they're useful for in the garden, and a lot about what's going on in hybridizing at the moment. So it's kind of an extension of the one that Patrick gave. So uh, let me move over and put my screen up. Is that coming through okay? It's not there. Yet. There it is. Yep. Okay. And I presume everybody else can see what we've got there. Or... Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> well, knowing and growing Siberians, and in a sense, the, uh, the first question might be, why do this? There are lots of nice ornamental plants that you can grow in your garden that have special uses. And what is it about Siberian iris that make them valuable and uh, even in some cases unique in their properties such that you would spend some time hybridizing them, you'd spend some money buying them, spend some time growing them. So uh, this is uh, the first question we might ask. and. Uh, the answer, whoops, I seem to have things all over here, don't so worry, is that the basic structure is of a good clump is just beautiful. It's like a bouquet in the garden. And even after the foliage has, uh, after the uh, flowers have gone, the foliage is really rather pleasant in the sense it's like a, almost like a, an ornamental grass uh, with straight, to sharp leaves and so on. So it can hold its place even when it's not in bloom. Um, here's a couple of examples of very, very nice clumps looking just like this, the bouquet effect. Sky mirror on the left, B. Warburton, ginger twist on the right from Schaefer, Schaefer Stacks. And uh, so what this can do in the garden for you is several things. 
<clears throat> one of them, they make good action plants, uh, standing on their own, not combined with other flowering plants at all. Uh, they look good by the water side, there's something sort of natural about that. And then they are pretty good in mixed perennial planting. So let's take a look at these uses. Uh, first of all, a couple more clumps, because that's so important to get a good looking clump. On the left is Swans in Flight, that's ours. And on the right, uh, one that always makes a nice clump for us, Tree of Songs, a yellow from uh, <coughs> Schaefer Sachs. Uh, what do I mean by uh, accent plants? Well, here's an example. Here's Siberian iris sitting, standing on its own, but the fact that it's there in bloom makes that whole scene. Um, and uh, you can see that even if you just cut the flowers off, it still would have a contribution to make in terms of leaf shape in combination with all of the other ones. Uh, here's another example of an accent with, uh, this is a Charming Darlene from Anna Mae Miller. Um, and that, that brings us into the area that I mentioned of waterside, because for whatever reason, Siberians and water seem to go together. And here's some examples, just ones that I've taken at times mostly, uh, showing how natural they look along a waterway, a pond, a river, a stream, a lake. Uh, that's Golden Gate Park in uh, San Francisco. I wish I was there a week later when that would have been in full bloom, but I wasn't. Uh, this is from the Pacific Northwest. And uh, here's another one uh, showing the, the sort of waterside attraction of, uh, of Siberian irises. And then uh, even perhaps more important than that is the fact that they play well with other plants. <laughs> I mean that uh, they're not so dominant that they try to rule the landscape, but they add greatly to, to groups of uh, flowering plants. I got quite a few examples that I'll run through kind of quickly. Most of them taken in our own backyard, by the way. Uh, that's one with some Shasta daisies. Uh, poppies, they always look nice with poppies. Uh, peonies, again, they bloom at the same time as many peonies and work well with them. Another peony shot there. Uh, <clears throat> that's a Wygelia bush and uh, uh, a Siberian in front of it, and they, uh, that's always been an attractive thing for years, growing just outside our front door. Uh, this is at the bottom of the garden where it's a bit wetter, and you can see there with primulas, uh, looking very nice. Uh, that's uh, one that's derived from a, a species called Iris typifolia that we'll talk about later, that's very early blooming. And then uh, a bit more exotic, maybe. Uh, here they, is, they are uh, with a big color contrast against some lupins. And here's the last one showing that. And just everything all together, just a, a, a lovely uh, patch uh, with several Siberians, the lupins, the peonies, some catmint over on the left, fox clubs at the back, all in a fairly happy combination. So uh, there are a lot of things that they can contribute to a garden in different ways. So if you want to grow them, what's the secret? Well, it's important to know where they come from and what their normal climatic soil such conditions are. So let's go right back to the beginning and look at where they come from. And um, <clears throat> the ones that we generally see in the garden, the ones that are in most catalogs and people plant, are what is known as 28 chromosomes. They get called garden Siberians, that's not an official name. Uh, it just is a way of being able to reference and that rather than using the rather clumsy 28 chromosome all the time. But the point here is that there are three species here, Iris sanguinea, Iris siberica, and Iris typifolia. At least that's what taxonomists tell us. There's a recent publication saying, no, they're all one species. There's not three different ones. We'll have to let the taxonomists fight that out, I guess. But at the moment, the general feeling is that there are three distinct species that combine together to make these Siberians. For some people who don't know Siberians very well, it comes as a surprise that there's a second group. And that is the group that has 40 chromosomes and are called Sino-Siberians, again, unofficially. Sino meaning Chinese. 
Uh, we won't go through all the different species here. Uh, it is interesting to note down at the bottom there, you would think that all the iris species that ever existed would have been described quite a while back, but not so. Iris Ramsayi was described from uh, uh, an area of northern India just 10 years ago as a new species. So we keep discovering things even now, I guess. Uh, why do we not spend a lot of time with the photic chromosomes? Uh, the answer comes up here. This is the sort of world distribution map for all of these groups. But let's focus on, on the photic chromosomes down here at the bottom here. They are coming from the Himalayas, Nepal, across into the mountains of North Mountains of Burma and Southern China, which is also mountainous. So they're mountainous and they are also pretty much subtropical. That's the, I can get this to work. There's the Tropic of Cancer. So some of them are sitting right on the subtropical area. And um, they're quite isolated from these other 28 chromosomes. So what does that confer on them? What do they need to be able to grow there? Well, first of all, they're growing up high in the mountains, even as high as 10,000 feet, but it's semi-tropical. So actually that makes it quite an equitable climate. It's cool, it's moist, it doesn't change hugely over the year. Soil's acidic, no large temperature extremes because the height balances their location down towards the equator. Um, for this reason, they're not easy to grow in the US outside the Pacific Northwest in the US and Canada. Uh, they don't like intense cold, such as we might have in uh, Michigan or up in Canada. Uh, nor do they like heat and humidity, and they don't like dryness. And finding a place that doesn't have some dryness, some heat and humidity or intense cold really sort of narrows you down to the Pacific Northwest. And they grow nicely there. Uh, you can try and grow them elsewhere, I've tried. They last two or three years and then they tend to dwindle and, and go away. I've never had one that survived much longer than that. They do cross easily within the group and can be done that way, but they don't cross with the 28s at all easily. There are almost no examples of 40 by 28 crosses. They do cross with the Pacific Coast irises because the Pacific Coast have 40 chromosomes too, so they match up in that sense, and they give what are called calcibes, which are sterile, but can be quite lovely flowers. So unfortunately, most of us are denied the chance to grow these, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about them much further because of that. Uh, but let's take a, just another look at what we're missing. Here's an example from British Columbia, and you can see the very, very ex attractive, almost black, Iris chrysographes, photochromosome with a little bit of gold writing on there. And then uh, more in the background, the sort of light blue derivative from Iris sanguinea at 28. So there you can grow them both. But wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to grow that black baby there? We don't have any black Siberians in the 28 group. I keep trying to get some and I get somewhat close, but uh, it's, a, it's a goal for breeders would be to get something that looked like that in the 28s, I rather think. And here are a few, just a few more, so you can see what you're missing. Uh, Bronzy Marvel there, uh, Lorena Reed did a lot of work with this uh, out on the West Coast. Dotted line, I don't think anyone's ever seen that growing without they wanted it. I know I have tried several times. Uh, Blue Meadowfly came from Germany, Marlene Arberg, and that did grow for about three years in our garden and, uh, and was appreciated while it was there. And then uh, a tetraploid here. And then just to show you a different color, Miss Margaret uh, from Lancaster, Lanc uh, that Patrick Spence uh, introduced. And he does some breeding with them now, does Patrick. So there is breeding going on, but um, it's a pretty restricted area that can hope to grow them well. So let's uh, spend the rest of our time talking about the 28s. And let's go back to this map and see where the 28s come from. And you can see they're a more northerly group of plants. Uh, Eastern Europe right across the Russian steppe and, and uh, so on as far. I don't know how far to the east they really go. They may go further than that. Uh, and then on the other side is the second species, Iris sanguinea, uh, that sort of goes across to meet them, but from the Chinese and the Asian side, goes right across Japan, the Koreas, Mongolia, 
a little bit in Russia, some in China. Iris typhifolia, the third one, is a sort of uh, uh, similar area for its growth, more restricted. Um, so they are more northerly and more uh, not particularly high mountain growing. And if you look at the three species that make up the 28 chromosome group, this is Iris Siberica. Uh, the characteristics here you can see on the right are they tend to be rather tall plants. The flowers are held well above the foliage. They're rather small flowers uh, compared to what some of the other species have and what we have now in the gardens. Uh, but they're produced in profusion. They're well branched. They have lots of buds and uh, uh, very nice. Uh, the flowers often tend to have this uh, uh, sort of stripy veining on them. Uh, so this would be a typical Iris Siberica. Then if we go to Sanguinea, uh, we see some differences. The flowers are a bit bigger. They tend to probably be just above the foliage, not high above the foliage in most cases. Uh, the name Sanguinea means bloody, and it comes from the fact that the flower sheath here has a sort of reddish color, doesn't look quite like blood, but that's where it comes from. So that's a characteristic. And the other thing is that they very frequently only have two buds. So it's very different from Siberica. And one of the challenges for hybridizers is to get that branching and bud count up. And I would say at the moment, if you get four to five buds, one branch, you're about in decent shape to be able to go ahead with something. But for Siberica, seven, eight buds is quite possible. I've seen some with four and five buds in one terminal. In, in some cases. And one or another of the sort of goals for hybridizing, at least to me, is to get all of these plants with three buds in the terminal. And if you think about it, if all those buds are gonna develop sequentially into nice flowers, you have increased the flowering time by 50% by going from two to three buds. And uh, I must say most of the tetraploids that we have now uh, have three buds in the terminal and that's what we always look for, so. Uh, it's a matter of finding the compromise between the uh, the two groups in terms of flowers and uh, branching bud count and so on. And then the third group is is really only fairly recently appeared in the Western world. It's from China, and uh, about the, in the 80s, going into the 90s. This is Iris typhifolia. It doesn't offer very much that's different from the others in terms of color and form and branching. What it does offer is a, a different kind of foliage. You can see it's very narrow and it's spirally twisted. And uh, the big thing that I think from a hybridizer's point of view is helpful is that they bloom earlier than the other kinds. So if you have a typhifolia or typhifolia cross, it may well be in bloom a week or two weeks before the main crop of Siberians. And that's always worth having to extend the range. Uh, the other thing I find in making those crosses is that there is some hybrid vigor. Some of those crosses between Typhifolia and the other species are really pretty strong growers, and uh, that's not uncommon to find something like hybrid vigor coming out of those kinds of crosses. So that's what there was originally, and that's what hybridizers have had to work with over the years. So uh, we've talked about how that's developed as a, towards the end, but let's talk about growing them now. As I say, they, they come from the temperate zones, they grow in meadows, woods edges, along the edge of mountain streams. Uh, they can be quite damp in the in spring time, you're getting melt off from uh, snow in the mountains and so on. Uh, they can be dry during the summer, I mean they don't like long droughts, but two or three weeks without rain isn't going to kill them. Um, so under the best circumstances they like fairly cool, moist soil and acid to neutral, or just a little above neutral, but not much. So they're pretty easy to grow in the cooler areas of the US, but uh, as I say, they can tolerate some heat and humidity and dryness if, uh, if that happens to be what the year offers. One thing that is necessary is, is winter cooling for flowering. And so this is what often tends to limit them from uh, being worth growing in the southern states. I put zone nine there, but honestly, it seems to vary with the cultivar. 
And with what kind of zone nine, zones only tell you about winter temperature. There's a lot more goes into it than that. So as I say, they will grow in, in, in California quite decently, particularly the northern and central parts, but they will not do very well down in say Southern Georgia or Southern Texas probably. Uh, they are very hardy, they'll go way up into the north, uh, even perhaps as far as zone three with a winter temperature down around minus 30 is not going to take them out. And the last thing is that the 328 chromosome species that we've talked about all intercross very easily. And what you get from those crosses, particularly Sanguinea and Siberica, is what we call the garden Siberians. So culture, well, that comes from what I just said. They are moisture loving, but they are not bog plants. It would be a mistake to plant them in the water. But by the side of the water or where they get good deal of rain, or particularly during the spring when they're growing, they like a, a good deal of inches of rain a month or take at that time. And um, that's a, a, a factor that you have to take into account. Uh, more soil types, we say five, five to seven. Uh, it, can, I, it can go a little above seven, but not much. Uh, they like organic matter in the soil, um, but really the only kind of soil that's a real challenge is heavy clay, which is not a, a good medium for them without improvement. Uh, they need the sun to bloom as almost any iris does, but they can benefit from some shade when the sun is intense in the afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> they are not picky feeders. And um, I got taken to task about this because from Chuck Chapman, of course I have in the test uh, that, uh, it's it recommended that bearded iris don't see much nitrogen. And you do see that quite frequently. He uh, contends that uh, there's no proof of that at all. And in fact, it's wrong. So we needn't worry about the tall beardeds because the Siberians like some fertilizer. 10-10-10 uh, in the spring, uh, and then a second application after bloom is just fine and get some growing and fine. You might even try a bit more on sandy soil where the fertilizer washes through with the rain um, and uh, definitely more than you recommended uh, for TBs very often. Uh, I'll tell you what we use. Uh, we use 4700 nitrogen, slow release. It's what they use for growing corn and it lasts the whole year and uh, they seem to like it very well. We put some nitrogen in a little bit of phosphorus in with that too, but uh, uh, that's uh, our standard feeding regimen in the spring. Uh, transplantation, well, you can do it in the spring when they're just starting to put on a nice bit of growth. And as long as you plant them and keep them uh, uh, moist uh, and you don't get some horrible burst of hot weather, they'll probably take off and do very nicely. You can actually replant them after bloom if you get the same kind of conditions, but uh, having moisture and keeping cool is not the best shot there in the middle of the summer. And so the fall is another very good time to transplant them. And uh, that's what we usually do uh, sometime in late August. Uh, it's cooling down then and it gives the roots time to get down and grow for a month or two and get them nicely rooted before the, the winter comes and any frost heaving might occur. But the spring and the fall are certainly quite good times for moving them. When do they need replanting? Well, that's really up to the grower. Uh, some of them probably hardly ever do need transplanting. The clump just gets bigger and bigger. If it gets out of hand, obviously it has to be uh, taken apart and moved. Some of them do develop uh, uh, centers without flowers, particularly some of the tetraploids seem to do that. Um, and uh, if that happens and they sort of start to lose their clump effect, best thing is to dig it up, divide it, replant the parts. Uh, but it varies with the cultivar and the conditions to some degree. One thing I can't stress too much here and another, it's another big difference from the beardeds, and that is that you've got to keep those roots moist at all times once you've got them out of the ground. Uh, you can't do what people do with their TBs, which you dig them up, put them in a bag, throw them in the garage for a few weeks, and then go back out and plant them when they get the time. 
there you won't find any Siberians surviving there. They have to be kept moist. They like to be planted with the crown, that's where the uh, shoots are starting and the leaves are attached to the rhizome, an inch or two below the surface. And then uh, you must keep them damp uh, until they've established some good growth. And uh, so that's really the requirement for transplanting or with ones you've bought, do not let them dry out. And uh, all of this would lead you to believe that mulching is something that's very useful, and it is. Um, again, most people don't recommend mulching uh, TBs and beardeds because they might cause rot. That's not going to happen with the Siberians. Uh, mulching cools the soil. It helps keep weeds down. Uh, it keeps the moisture in. The only negative is that it can conceals rodents during the winter time. And I'll have a little bit to say about voles later on, but they like to live down in that mulch and they don't get caught by hawks and so on that usually keep their levels down. So this is it. Uh, we've talked a little about growing them. Pests and diseases, I'll refer you back to the one that uh, the webinar we gave already. But just to mention a few things here, uh, if you live west of the Rockies and in the more northerly states, you will get to know the iris borer face to face. It's a nasty, nasty beast, an inch and a half, even up to two inches long. It eats rhizomes just for breakfast. And they are very, very good at finding irises. Um, the, we are, there are a range of controls for them. One thing I think is worth mentioning here, though, is that over the last couple of years, I and a few other people have become fairly much convinced that there are two generations a year of these things. Every textbook will tell you there's just one, that the uh, adults come out in the fall, lay their eggs on the iris foliage, they overwinter as eggs, and then when it warms up in the spring, those eggs hatch, the little larvae feed on the irises, bore down into the rhizomes, and then the next generation follows. But I'm pretty sure that not all of those iris borer larvae actually pupate and become adults in the, in the year that they grow. Some of them overwinter as larvae. And then what they do is pupate and come out as adults in the spring and lay their eggs much later. And you will see some damage, uh, say in July, as we've been seeing it. Not a lot, uh, but, and then you dig in, you see some borers there. And I think there's pretty good evidence that in fact, uh, under some circumstances, Maybe if you control the first generation very effectively, you will select for a second generation and you have to take different remedial measures for that. Uh, I hope it's not true, but I'm afraid it could be. And uh, so that's something to look forward to. Uh, other things are pod weevils that get into the pods and eat the seeds. Uh, bud fly is a big problem out on the uh, far east side, uh, little, uh, maggots that get into the flower buds and eat the buds and of course destroy the flowers, etc. cetera. Uh, we don't deal anymore with them. Uh, I want to talk about diseases a little bit and uh, let's take a look at the disease situation. Another of the nice things about growing Siberians is they are not susceptible to leaf spot and they are not susceptible to bacterial soft rot. Um, the leaf spot is familiar to virtually anybody who grows bearded iris and uh, probably won't kill the iris but it sure don't look good and then of course the soft rot is something that people complain about every year when the iris gets stinky and mushy and is essentially destroyed and the uh, carotivora uh, organism that does it proliferates and is in the soil for a long period of time so that's something you won't see with Siberians, but I'm not going to pretend they're completely immune. There are a couple of things that you do see quite rarely. One of them is botrytis, and that's a disease of prolonged cool, wet weather. And if you pull on those dead leaves, they'd be on the outside of the uh, group, and they would be kind of dry at the bottom. Um, this is the other thing that you can see, and it's uh, the opposite sort of situation when the central leaves start browning and dying and you pull on them and out they come with this rot at the bottom. And um, this is an, in hot, wet weather. Um, 
I think as hybridizers, we've been pretty good at avoiding using plants susceptible to this uh, for parentage. And you rarely see this anymore. I don't anyway. Um, if you do see it and you see it often, I suggest you dig the plant up, throw it away. Because there are lots and lots of wonderful Siberians that don't do this. Why spend your time fighting it? And uh, so get rid of them if you see significant evidence in a normal year of this kind of uh, disease. And then we mentioned furry creatures. Okay, well, one of the great advantages of irises in general, and Siberians is right in there with them, is that deer don't like them. Uh, we never have to protect any of the irises, although we have our own deer herd out back here, which seems to increase every year. Um, and, uh, but uh, rarely, if ever, do they interfere with the irises. So that's a huge advantage in uh, areas where the deer population is growing. On the other hand, this is what voles can do. And I don't usually hear a lot of people talking about vole damage. So maybe it's something that I am particularly sensitive to. But what you can see here is over winter, this nice big fat clump of a Siberian has been reduced because the voles have chewed the entire rhizome area out here. They've lived on it in the winter. They probably made a nest in the debris down here for all I know. They didn't, thankfully, didn't take it all. There's a bit they didn't eat there that shows what it would be like. And then a few little new shoots coming up from fragments that didn't get destroyed. But they, uh, they can do considerable damage. Voles seem to me to be like a lot of organisms that they have population declines and population increases depending on things like weather and food. And when you get a population explosion, they can cause some real damage or they have in our situation. Uh, again, I won't go into too many ideas about what you can do with them. If you trap them, my advice is not to handle them because they bite very, very nicely. And uh, you only would handle one once, I think. So I don't know how people got this shot. It must have been drugged, I think, but uh, whatever. <laughs> Uh, what can you do? Well, biological control, of course, what could be better? And get yourself a couple of cats and they will have fun getting rid of the voles in your garden, I can guarantee you. Hawks in the wintertime are another one if they can find the voles and um, they, they do a nice job of that too. So that's the, uh, the pest situation uh, in a nutshell, shall we say. Let's move along and talk about breeding now for the rest of the time. Bob? Yeah. And I have one question, maybe what, before you move on to uh, breeding, uh, is if you could go back, uh, just talk about a little bit back about the uh, fertilizer. And there's a question, did you say 4700 fertilizer in the spring? What kind of fertilizer is that? That is one that is not easily available. I'm sorry, but it's what is used in growing corn commercially. And you have to buy it in largest quantities. Fortunately, I know a guy who buys it in largest quantities and lets me take some. So it's slow release. Uh, and of course, you don't use it in huge amounts with that nitrogen content. But the slow release is nice because it is released slowly over the growing year. And if you, and if you can find some good, there are some uh, commercial slow release ones. Uh, there's a real advantage to that. You just put it on once and that's done for the year. But uh, I probably shouldn't have mentioned it because it's not available in 10 and 25 pound bags. You're, uh, you're buying a couple of hundred pounds of that stuff or, or a thousand pounds or whatever. Uh, but if you know anybody who grows corn, you can always talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there is a, a comment from Janet and Jim Wilson says nitroform is available to us smaller growers. Yeah. Yeah, there are some. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, wow. Time is going on. I'm afraid I'm going to run on a little bit over here. I apologize. Um, let's talk about breeding here as quickly as uh, I can get it done. Uh, there's a history here, of course. Back uh, 100 years ago, uh, the kind of irises that were being grown then, the Siberians, were probably not, not bred by anybody. They were grown from seed or they were found in nature. Here's an example. That's Iris Perry's blue. No one knows, I think, how Amos Perry came by this. His records, I don't think, tell anything. But very likely, if he grew it at all, he grew it from some seeds that he collected from other irises. 
it really wasn't until the, the 30s that serious breeding began. And that's where we get this miracle, Caesar's brother, bred by uh, F. Cleveland Morgan in Canada, uh, 1932. This was a control cross, a sanguinea versus a, a Siberica. It has enormous vigor. Um, it grows more widely than any other one I know. It's still in the catalogs, although when you get really get Caesar's brother or something else, you won't know really. But still, it's um, it's a miracle of an iris, and it's still very much around at the moment. But his qualities come a lot, I think, from the fact of uh, being a control cross. And then a, a, another big advance occurred in the 50s with this white swirl. And now if you look at it, knowing modern Siberian, you say, well, there's nothing special about that. The thing that was special was the form, which at that time was quite unusual with the flaring horizontal falls, the, uh, the curled, swirled falls, and virtually every hybridizer fell in love with it. It ruled the world of hybridizing for 30 years. Uh, to the almost the exclusion of anything else, everybody used white swirl, and it still governs the form in general of a lot of the irises that we have today. It was very influ influential in terms of breeding of Siberians because of its form. Uh, <clears throat> a few other things that have come along that have been very important. First of all, is yellow. Yellow is not a color that occurs naturally in the 28s, and uh, the first really good yellow was butter and sugar in the 1970s. And we'll take a look at yellow in more detail as we come along. About the same time, tetraploids, that is things with four sets of chromosomes uh, became available and we'll talk about them some. And it wasn't until all oh, the late eighties, early nineties that people suddenly remembered or one group of people that Iris Siberica has a different form and an interesting one that you could work with. And that's when Snow Prince came in as a Siberica that people were using for breeding. And the last thing are some mutant forms, multi-petal forms and six fall forms that people sometimes call flatties. And uh, we'll talk about those two. Let's talk about yellow first. This is butter and sugar. Curry and McEwen in Maine, line bred the irises until he got something that you could truly say was yellow. Of course, it's an amino, it's got a white top. And that was a, a great attraction to all hybridizers. We spent some time with it. Uh, got what I think is an improved shape with hello yellow there. And then uh, heading towards an all yellow iris rather than a mina with uh, laugh out loud. Uh, and other people have done very good things with this. And uh, SS stands for Schaefer Sachs. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, of course, primary Siberian breeders these days. Um, that's one with a little bit of a lighter edge on the yellow, solar energy, lovely, lovely one. And this Cape Cod uh, has almost a sort of, you can almost guess an orangey effect in the buds. It is just one of their introductions for this year, Cape Cod girls. So people still working with yellows, but no one's surprised to see yellow Siberian anymore. What is best about this is the fact that you can combine the yellow with the lavender or the red violet or even the blue shades that exist already and get all sorts of mixtures that give you a lot of new color ranges. And that's been perhaps the single most exciting thing that's happened with the Siberians in the last years. <clears throat> to give you an example, this is a, a picture of their garden that uh, the Schaefer Saxes gave, gave me for the talk showing before yellow came along, there probably would be some red violets in there, but you can see just whites and blues, that's, that's it. And then after yellow came along, that's what it looks like. <laughs> Talk about a difference, but you can see all these Siberian clumps that have got sort of mixtures of yellows with red violets and so on and so forth that are lighting up the scene. So what a difference it, it made. Uh, tetraploids. Well, they've been produced by Kerry and McEwen too. He did both the yellow and tetraploids. They have four sets of chromosomes rather than the two that have come naturally in the wild. There are no te wild tetraploid Siberians. Um, 
is generally done by treating the diploid seedlings with colchicine that doubles up the chromosome numbers, kind of primitive genetic engineering. Uh, don't think there's anything unusual about tetraploidy. It's very usual in plants. And most bearded iris are already naturally tetraploid. They, uh, they are just tetraploids anyway. Uh, so the tetraploids and diploids all over the place. They tend to have larger flowers and heavier substance, maybe more ruffling, some broader foliage and something that's a problem sometimes, shorter stems. But there's really nothing that tetraploidy does that you can't actually get in a diploid. Uh, it's just that they uh, combine different things in different ways and have a somewhat larger and more, I won't say glamorous look, but a, a, a bit more sort of striking individual flower look. A vigor at least as good as the diploids, I would say, <clears throat> and they generally don't interbreed with diploids very readily. This is a sort of evolution. Uh, this was the very first one, fourth old white carrier, 1970. And that's a, a, just a stiffer version of an Irish sanguinea white, not frankly all that attractive, a bit like a propeller, uh, but since it was tetraploid, it was exciting. Terrier went on to do a lot of breeding with them and changed them quite a bit from that. Here's an example of one of his later ones, 1985 Regency Bell, much broader form, interesting color variations. We still grow it and I like it every year. Um, we've done a lot of work, I say we, that's me, and uh, uh, here are a couple of ones that we've had luck with, uh, Blueberry Fair, and then uh, over on the right, Judy, 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 which is named for my wife, I might mention. Um, both of those won the Morgan Wood Medal, and that tells you now that what it has happened with the Siberians is that the tetraploids and diploids coexist. They're not one preferred over the other in general, both of them can win awards, and they're treated as pretty much equivalent. Uh, that has not happened with all of the uh, irises where people have made tetraploids, but they now are equally interesting as Siberian iris. Uh, we're, of course, not the only people who've done this. Uh, Dean Cole in Maine with my first kiss, that's a beautiful iris. I recommend anyone to get that. And then uh, we have uh, Curious Choice, which is uh, one of Dunlop's, uh, and one of the very few yellow tets. This has been a challenge, and I won't go into why and what and where. I think I've got some nice yellow tets now, but it's taken a lot of effort to get yellow ones that are good. And then we mentioned going back to Iris Siberica, and here's the thing that did it. This is Snow Prince, um, which is a very typical whitish uh, Siberica and caught at people's attention, very floriferous, lovely clump. And people with more imagination than me, I said, oh yeah, that's very 1920s and moved on. Said, look, you know, if we now breed that with some different colorings and we can get new things that are interesting and useful. And again, the Schaefer Sachs uh, people from Joe Pyweed's garden said, okay, let's give it a try. And they did, and they came up trumps because they produced a whole race of Siberica-like, but different colored uh, <clears throat> Siberians. That's banished misfortune. You'll notice it got the Morgan Wood Medal in 2011. So Van Gogh, 2012. So they were liked by people and they were different. And uh, there's many more of them, but I, I only show you, you a couple. Uh, one that I have liked and grows in our garden still, and every year gets an admiring glance is white amber to the extent that I've used it in breeding in our program and it's given us some nice things. Uh, that's one called lemon mousse, uh, which uh, did well. And that is called hot, 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 which comes out of lemon mousse and just got an AM this year. And that has some progeny coming out of it for the future too. So uh, <clears throat> it's been an interesting and very significant re reversal to using Siberica. And then uh, the last thing we want to talk about are the multipetals. Uh, they come primarily from Japan, discovered mutations out on farms and so on. Um, and they uh, basically, they got the most interest when they came over for the 1983 Siberian Convention. 
And Bob Barr and John Coble made good use of them. That's Kaboom and that's Imperial Opal, two of the multi-petal ones. You could call them doubles if you like. What they have is uh, one flower here with probably six fours rather than three and standards. And then in the middle of it, a second flower, full flower growing up in the middle called hose in hose. Now it's not unknown among flowers, the number of them do it, but it gives a tremendously full and you can say double effect. And you can see the same thing here with a second flower growing up through the middle of the first one and multiple parts on the first one. I've always found these interesting and we've done a fair amount of breeding with them too. That's one of ours called Double Play. And uh, there's another one that's a more recent introduction a couple of years ago called Petalicious. And that's taken on a, a little bit different form. It has three falls, six standards, and the second flower growing up through the middle of it. The genetics here are a little bit complicated, but not too bad. So this is uh, something that uh, at least there are continuing to be introductions in this area. Then you get the flatties, the six four ones. Uh, this is uh, Hiroshi Shimizu, uh, sent this one, Hiroko Oji, means six princes in Japanese. Uh, you will find uh, it in catalogs these days. And uh, I forget what they call it now, something about stars. They, they've changed the name of it because Rocco Oji doesn't sell. Um, that's one of ours too, and another of ours, pure flattery that we introduced a couple of three years ago. Still working in this area, but as a, for now I won't go into the reasons. Proved to be quite a difficult area from the point of view of improving breeding, but still giving it a try as I'll show you towards the end. So this is the second mutation that uh, I think makes Siberians interesting, more interesting. So let's take a look at some current introductions. And I have to say that I've probably got another 10 or 15 minutes. Is that too much for you guys? No, that's uh, not at all. You can, uh, you can- Are you quite sure? Okay. I do have one question just talking about the colors. Um, okay. Chuck Chapman, is the yellow uh, carotenoid or flavonoid? Uh, I think it's flavonoid. Okay. I'm not sure how well it's been characterized, but I'm pretty, Sure, that's it. Uh, this is some, these are some fairly recent introductions that we're looking at now. What is it that's come lately or will be coming? Uh, here's Terry Aitken working on what he calls extended bloom Siberians. Uh, Siberians, some of them will bloom for a second time uh, a week or two after the first bloom, not in the fall, but uh, they usually don't put on much of a show, to be honest. To, couple of three bloom stalks go up. Most of them don't do it at all. Um, but it's, it's always interesting to see. <clears throat> but Terry's worked on this and he's got a set of Siberians that do this much better than any other ones I've seen. And in fact, we've had some of them blooming through well into July in our garden, uh, at least decently. Uh, and this is a huge thing if we could get it to be regular in the Siberians extending the bloom season. Uh, here, the, the ones he introduces are beautiful irises anyway. They don't need to rebloom to be worth growing. Here's Burgundy Fireworks, which is one of his, and Cream of the Crop, lovely. And then uh, this year's introduction, which is Veins All Over, so that's a 2023 introduction. And all of them are in this extended bloom series. And from what I understand from him, he's doing a lot of breeding in this area, got a lot of seedlings. So we may expect to see things coming along in this way, hopefully uh, for some time to come. The uh, mixture of yellow with red violet and blue I mentioned, and particularly uh, Marty Schaefer and Jan Sachs have worked wonders with this. They far and away dominated this area to my disappointment because we gave it a try and didn't come up with what they've come up with. Um, it's so hard they put out six, seven good irises every year, interesting ones, and I had to choose just a few to show here. So what I did was pick ones that grow well for us and that I think illustrate some of the things that they've had going on. Here's a combination of yellow with red violet, giving a kind of hot chestnutty color, paprikash. They're very much into the spicy colors. 
uh, which a lot of you I know grow and it's won the top awards and so on. Um, but a Scotch fir is one of my best favorites. A much lighter amount of red violet there, but enough to turn it into butterscotch from yellow and a lovely form. Here we see the combination of yellow and blue, which is perhaps in many times a little bit less successful than in new things, uh, but not always because this won the best iris, best Siberian at the recent iris convention out in near Seattle. So it was doing very nicely there. <clears throat> Festive co coquette, ah, look at that form. And look, I mean, if you had been transported from 30 years back, and told that was a Siberian iris, you would have laughed your head off. It could not be, no way. Um, but again, you can see the yellow and, and red violet blends. And then this really isn't the same. This is heading off in another direction <clears throat> with enhanced veining um, and uh, juniper lee, again, a beautiful, uh, an original iris. And they sent me some uh, photographs of things that they have lined up for introduction being considered. And again, it was so difficult to choose, but I did choose four of them. They only have numbers now, but these are some Schaefer saxes that you may see in the future. They have a lovely deep sort of brownie red color with the light top. Uh, this, uh, when I saw it, I thought, wow, that is hot. <laughs> I've never seen an iris a Siberian with that coloration before, uh, just marvelous. <clears throat> Here's uh, another with the sort of uh, glowy uh, thumb spot in the middle of the falls. And I put this in just to show that you don't have to have everything new and wonderful to have a fine iris. And that's one of the, I would say a little bit more traditional, certainly in color, but a beautiful looking uh, iris anyway. So these are ones that uh, you may see and similar ones coming in future. We'll uh, take a look at uh, Dunlop and Cole and what they're up to. These are a couple of Jeff Dunlops, uh, Crimson Fireworks, which is uh, really a lovely color. And then Edge of Tomorrow with that Picotty white edge around it. Jeff hasn't introduced anything much since then, but I've seen photographs of his more recent tetraploids. These are all tetraploids. And uh, he's got some striking things there. I do hope that he'll get them introduced in the next year or two, because they will uh, cause a lot of interest. And then uh, we got Dean Cole, who has introduced a couple more recently. That topaz ruffles about as full as you can ever expect to see a Siberian, nice coloring too. And then lemon quartz, a little bit different coloring and very, very ruffled. <clears throat> uh, I realized that in doing this, I've left out a bunch of hybridizers who probably think they have every right to be included. And I apologize to them. We just didn't have time to cover everything. And then this guy here has some introductions. Um, this isn't a recent one, but I put it in because it's one of my favorites. Iris is it grows beautifully. And every year I think, wow, that's just gorgeous. Good Neptune's gold, which is won the Morgan Wood medal. But uh, whoops, some more recent ones than that. This is a diploid, Icaramba, very hot color combination. Uh, this is golden hearted, uh, diploid again, and you can see the sort of yellow center. The interesting thing about this is that the falls start off pure yellow. And during the first day, that outer rim becomes white and then it stays that way. So it goes through a sort of transition, which is rather fun to watch actually. Um, this is Staphyr starburst, a very strong growing tetraploid that we introduced recently, and ruby riches. <coughs> and again, you can start to see the effects of having yellow and red and violet together. The, the yellow doesn't go out as far as that, but this area shows the kind of coloring that you can get by combining the two. So those are some uh, that have been introduced then this last year. Uh, or two, that's another of the uh, doubles. Uh, how delicious. Same pattern, three, six, and then hose in hose. And this chasing fireflies, which is a fascinating one in its own way, because the amount of purple you get varies greatly. It does rebloom, repeat bloom, and when it does, it's often almost black. I say black iris would be nice to get. 
uh, and sometimes it's lighter. It's, uh, it's very variable depending on weather and whether it's a rebloom or not, but uh, it's a hot combination there. Well, just can't hit the right button, there we go. And then this year, these are the two uh, sun sprinkles with the uh, sunny gold sprinkled across the, uh, the falls there. And another multi, uh, make mine a double. Uh, but here I'm getting at something I've been working on for a while. And that is if you do the doubling with an iris that is an amina or a bitone, what you get is four sets of colors. You get the first, uh, here we are. Here's your uh, first set of darker colors. And then you've got the standard, which are lighter. And then you've got dark and light again coming up through. So you get a kind of layering effect. And that's what I'm really trying to, to look at using things that have different standards and fall patterns. <clears throat> so you can get multiples of that. So there we are, those are the, uh, the ones. Oh, and by the way, I know that some of you have been waiting to find out when the Insata site comes back up again. It was down for a while, which is where Chasing Fireflies and Make Me a Double are, are located. And it's good to tell you that their site is back up again. And, they're in the business. And then lastly, some things that are babies from me. Uh, <clears throat> the one on the left is, a, is interesting. It's a very big flower, very uh, ruffly. Um, the coloring isn't all that original, but the fascinating thing is that the last two years it has bloomed as about the earliest of any of the irises I have. And that includes some that have typhifolia. Very, very early bloom. Um, I'm going to wait and see if it does the same this year. I can't say I noticed it do it before. So uh, the jury's out. But if it blooms again very early this year, I think that's an introduction just because of earliness, if nothing else. And here's a color combination that I don't think we've had much before. I'm not sure whether it's orange or pink or both. Uh, again, as you know, combining yellows and the uh, <clears throat> sort of lavender pinks in just the right proportion. And uh, rather nice coloring. I'm uh, not quite sure that that's a strong enough grower to introduce, but it's certainly being used as a parent. And then we always have to have a tetraploid or two, and that's uh, a very big, strong tetraploid uh, that uh, caught my eye for sure when it first bloomed a couple of years ago. And then the last two, Here's another of these uh, sort of multicolored uh, doubles. And it turns out that in this case, the, the second flower coming up through the middle is actually a different color somewhat than the, uh, than the first one was. So now you've got three colors or three versions. And it's gonna be interesting to see how this one develops, but uh, if it would stay like that, it's really quite, uh, quite interesting. And then flat is, there's a, a one that really blew me away when I first saw it with the lining and the dots and pure six fall. Again, keep your fingers crossed that grows well enough to ever be introduced, but uh, it's got some sibs that are, are, are similar. <clears throat> so that line is still going to. Well, that's it. That's uh, a very quick dash to what's going on in hybridizing, uh, at least in parts of the Siberian world. Uh, if you want to know where you can get these, uh, here's a list of sources of Siberians, and uh, uh, you probably know quite a few of these already. Uh, the uh, Schaefer Sachs ones, of course, are the Joe Pieweeds Garden. We do it through Ensarta. Uh, the, uh, some of the other new tetraploids are through Draycott, so on and so forth. Um, the other thing I'd like to do is invite you, if you really like Siberians, to join the Siberian Society. Um, it's not expensive, 10 bucks for a single annual. You can correspond with my wife and do it that way, or you can go to the Siberian Irises website or the AIS website and join on PayPal. And among the things you get are two issues a year of the Siberian Iris here, and uh, that's uh, the bonus. 
And this is the last thing. And I have to say thanks, first of all, to all you guys for sitting through this long presentation. And I hope it's been worth your while. And very much to my wife, Judy, who does a lot of the work around the place and gets relatively little credit for it. So without her, it would be nothing. And uh, I thank her greatly for what she does. And we work together on it. Thank you. OK, thank you, Bob. This, that was wonderful. Um, are there any uh, questions um, before we get to the test? Um, we will uh, we will have a um, go through the, the quiz for judges um, shortly. But um, if there are any questions at the moment, we'll uh, have Bob uh, consider those. Yeah, maybe I'll need this. I forgot. OK. Uh, someone said they'd like to see the resource page again, the, the sources. Um, okay. There you are. Shriners uh, don't sell a huge number, but they do sell uh, some good ones. If you're interested, they're always a good outfit. And Paul Black uh, did some hybridizing. I don't think he's doing it regularly with Siberians. And uh, they carry Paul Black's directions at Shriners. And then that uh, next page after the sources. Could we see that again? There you are. That's an important page. Invitation to join the Society for Siberian Irises. Okay, I don't think we have um, any other questions. Um, so we're ready to, I think we're ready to go to the, um, the quiz. Quiz, okay. Okay, so um, Bob, if you like, I'll, I can show the uh, test. Right? Yeah, why don't we do that? I'll get rid of mine. And you can put yours up. <clears throat> Hold on. There you go. Can you see it? Yes. yes. Okay. And, and to uh, just be, before you get started on it, if you have the, um, uh, you can print the PDF a copy of the of the test and answer those questions, send them in. If you have the online uh, version and you have it pulled up, um, you can answer those questions and then send them, just hit hit um, submit and that will um, that will go to to us and we will get it to um, the judges training chair and uh, you will get credit for the uh, hour, one hour of uh, judges training credit. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, number one is the three species, Sanguinea, Siberica, Typhifolia, and match them up to characteristics. Well, it's Typhifolia that blooms very early. It's Sanguinea that has those reddish flower sheets. Uh, it's called bloody iris for that reason, and it blooms near the foliage. And then by difference, Siberica is the one with the long stems and several or many buds. So those are the sort of general characteristics for the three species. All three species intercross readily. That's where we get our modern cultivars. That is true. The 40 chromosome Siberians grow near the tropics and need hot, humid weather to succeed. That's half true. Uh, they do grow near the tropics, but they absolutely do not want hot, humid weather to succeed. So the overall answer is false. Sorry, I was being a bit tricky there. <laughs> like bearded iris, Siberians are best grown with low levels of nitrogenous fertilizer, peace to chuck. <laughs> That's false. They, uh, 
they're quite happy to, to, to be well fertilized and will reward you for it. Uh, leaf spot is a common problem for Siberians, so you should cut the foliage back after flowering to avoid it. Uh, no, leaf spot is not a common problem for Siberians. It's not a problem at all. And if you cut the foliage back after they're flowering, you're just going to reduce their capacity to grow and flower in the next year, so don't do that. A reasonable minimum bud count for new cultivars is four to five and maybe one to two branches. Having three bud terminals is desirable. Yes, that's what we would like to see uh, as a minimum, reasonable minimum. Uh, Curry and McEwen introduced both yellow and tetrapoid garden Siberians, and that is true, he did. He was the person who brought both of those into the breeding lines. Uh, the introduction of the 28s was critical in making current blended colors possible. He sure was and has been a really major advance in, uh, in the garden worthiness of Siberians. And then lastly, unlike typical bearded irises, repeat bloom occurs one to several weeks after initial bloom, not in the fall. That is true, yeah. They do, I very, very, very rarely see them a rebloom in the fall, but it's not at all typical, atypical to see it a couple of weeks after the first bloom is over new flower stems coming up. So that's it. And then there was a bonus question. Uh, and uh, I mentioned some things that you, you, I just saw that you could sort of think through things and what you'd heard. Uh, some of the things we mentioned was it'd be kind of nice to have a black 24 Siberian, 28 <laughs> Siberian. Um, the uh, idea of increasing bud count and, and so on is uh, always in minds of, uh, of hybridizers. Uh, prolonging bloom, we talked about how Terry is doing that, and uh, that would be a wonderful thing if it could be achieved more regularly. Uh, getting sort of pink and orange colors, we mentioned too, is a, a good goal. Uh, this is more a personal one, perhaps, than most other people, but getting a good yellow tetraploid has been a hunt. Um, that's good enough. That's a few things that we talked about that, uh, uh, and you could probably think of some other ones that came up. Uh, in fact, if you, if you have any, I'd be happy to hear them, but uh, that's, uh, that just about does it, I think. <laughs>